Okay, welcome back. This is our uh, disciple class, formerly the Sunday school class for all. This particular class, until we finish the um, Ten Commandments, and I, I, I gather that after we finish the Ten Commandments, we want to go right straight into one of the catechism uh, classes, and most likely the confession, the Westminster Confession, or the Westminster, what, Roger Catechism. One of those we're going to be looking at once we finish the Ten Commandments. Okay? This is why I call it the Cypress of Christ. Okay? All right. So, we're in the Ten Commandments. We're on Commandment number, what, five? Number six. Yeah, we're on the Sixth Commandment. Let's go to prayer, and then we're going to review uh, the uh, question number... 91 uh, through 99 before we begin on what, on number what, six, the sixth commandment, okay? And also we're going to explain about what the law is, what the moral law is. All right, let's look to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you once again this blessed Lord's day that we come thanking you for who you are and what you have done. We pray, Father, for all who are disciples, whether they are learners and want to learn of your truth to be saved, or as true disciples who are already converted, who desire to grow in the Word of God. Your commission for us was to go out and make disciples. We know as we make disciples, we have many who are skeptic, many who have been indoctrinated wrong, many who are religious or non-religious, many who already attend church and many who do not attend church. But we are to make disciples. And we pray, Father, that as a church that we will stay glued to that main command and not very off for whatever reason. Give us the elders' guidance as we under shepherd your people as we will fulfill that solemn responsibility we will give wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to the man of God and be strengthened in Jesus' name and say amen. The moral law, the law. Now, I know that because of our upbringing, and again I say that because majority of us, about 80% of us most likely, give or take a few percentage, was raised in a an environment of dispensationism, of uh, hating the law, uh, ignoring the, the moral law. But the law of God in the Old Testament consists of the judicial law. The judicial law are those laws that help govern Israel. That was one part of the law. They needed to be governed. They needed to know what to do and what not to do as far as in the government and legislation and state and senate. Okay? Then there was the ceremonial law. Now the ceremonial law is mainly only those talking about feasts, days, holidays, holy days, offerings and sacrifices, tithes and offerings. That's the ceremonial laws. The third is the moral law, which is encompassed only the Ten Commandments. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, according to Colossians and Romans and Philippians, mainly so, those scriptures, those letters, it teaches that 
In fulfillment of Jesus' death on the cross, his atoning death, he fulfilled the ceremonial law. He fulfilled the judicial laws, and he fulfilled the moral law. But at the time of his death, through his sacrifice, according to Romans and Hebrews, mainly, he, and Colossians, he took away the sacrificial ceremonial laws and all the judicial laws. What is established to, in, the, in, in the hearts and minds of people from Adam to the second coming of Jesus Christ. We all have a duty towards God, our Creator. See, we must not think that only Christians can know the will of God, what God expects of His creation. We must not, as Christians, if we say we are Christians, if we say we are evangelical, if we say that we are a child of God, we must not impose certain scriptures upon the unsaved because they cannot keep that. Given the fact we cannot even be perfect and keep all of them. We sin as believers. So how can we put a yoke? I'm, 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 I'm kind of paraphrasing what Peter says. We can't put a yoke upon the Gentiles, the unsaved, for them to do this and do that when their hearts are not circumcised spiritually or they're not converted, they're not saved. That's the whole point of the law, the moral law. I would not have known sin, says Paul, except by the law. Through the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, when we, when we say law, many have been taught that when the scriptures say, and it does say, for we are not under the law, we are under grace. It does say so. But you see, the failure in interpreting the intent meaning of that verse is this. The context draws from salvation. We are not saved by the law of works. You, you, you can't, when you read in Romans 3, 2, all the way, Romans 1, all the way up to Romans 8, it's going to specifically talk about law. It's going to talk about the law of Christ, law of the works, law of the land, law of the marriage, law of the flesh, law of sin and death, law of the spirit. You've got to, you've got to be able to distinguish when it is talking about the moral law versus the law of the land, Romans chapter 13, the law of the government, Romans 13 again, the law of marriage, Romans chapter 7, the law of sin and death, Romans chapter 6, the law of the spirit of Christ, Romans 5 and 6, the law of nature, Romans excuse me, Romans chapter 1, because you will be caught up under the, the teaching that you're not under the law. We should ignore the law. There's no moral law. No, But you see, you, you, if I challenge you to get by yourself, to read and reread very carefully from Romans chapter 2 all the way up to Romans 8, and you will see Paul's mentioning that the different 
means or meaning intent of the word law. The law of sin and death. The law of spirit of Christ that made me free from the law of sin and death. See what I'm saying? And, 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 and then Paul says in Romans, he says, uh, he says, by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 7, 7. When he says, therefore no one is declared righteous in the sight of God by the works of the law. You he's dealing with justification, being accountable before God, which involves salvation. The moral law since the beginning of Adam and Eve, even up to today, still stands. As Paul said in uh, Romans, let me get it here. I just want to make this uh, claim uh, with the scripture teaching before we deal with it. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified, justified, declared righteous, has something to do with salvation now. A man is justified by faith without the works of the law. You can't get saved by doing what the law says of any type. Especially the Ten Commandments, because the Ten Commandments cannot save you. What the law could not do, and what the law could not do, Romans chapter 8, it was weak through the flesh. It, it, it shows us our sinfulness, Romans 7. It condemned me. It judged me. That's what the law does. It tells us you're not righteous, you're not holy, you deserve death because you broke the law. I'm, the law says I'm not going to show you no mercy, I'm not going to feel good about you, you deserve to die. That's what the law says. But where the law abounds and sin abounds, grace did much more abound. Grace says, I'll save you, I'll have mercy on you, I'll forgive you your sin, but you must repent and believe on the Lord. This is what mercy and grace it says. Okay? So, if we as believers can, can put aside our differences, our upbringing, our tradition, and really read verse by verse and see what the scriptures are saying, then we will come to the conclusion, as the scripture teaches, that the moral law, which is the Ten Commandments, is the duty of all men. And you may say, well, uh, we, we, it's, the law is holy, it's good, it's just, we can't keep it. That's the point. Because it shows us our sinfulness. It's not trying to get you to keep it, it's trying to show you your sinfulness. Okay? What, 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 we, what we're doing is we're trying to force people to do righteous things and we can't do that over here. So, so what, do we, what do we not say to people? Well, I'm, I'm saying, what the scripture, see, what we're saying is, see, we have a group of Christians who are, who are, who are, who are sincere and honest and, you know, and, and I, I, I can't say they're not saved or saved because only the Lord knows. But we can't impose on them to try to keep a high standard of the law. And what I mean by that is do not steal, do not commit crime, do not murder, do not commit abortion, do not put people in slavery in a vicious mean way because people in their nature is going to do that but you see a Christian a truly born Christian will keep with all its might through the power of the Holy Spirit those ten commandments 
we will fail God because we're in a we're in an imperfect body. We're not in a perfect body, even as Christians. We can't see. We can't make the United States. We cannot make Sudan. We cannot make Nigeria. We cannot make Haiti a Christian nation because everybody's not going to be a Christian. You follow me? And we cannot stipulate that you got to obey the word. You got to do what this and, and do this. See, that's the reason why we got to stick to the gospel. Had the church stuck with the gospel and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ instead of law, instead of government, civil rights, social rights, ethics, and all the other things that the church is doing. More people will come to know Jesus Christ and Savior, and then they will begin to implement those things in their lives. You see? But you see, we claim we're Christian, and yet we, we hate a certain race, a certain group of people, and, and that, that cannot be. And, and, and you're trying to pass laws and afflict them and everything and, and forcing them to do when they have not the power to do. You got to show them the gospel. But at the same time, you do let them know you are obligated and re do, required by God to obey God. To the unbeliever, they cannot do it, but you still got to put it out there. So, what is the duty God requires of man? You have that on the form right here on the Ten Commandments on the second sheet. If you turn over at the top, it says the moral law. What is the duty? The duty which God requires of man, all men, all children, all teenagers, young people, is what? To obey his revealed will. Can we do it? No. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to put a sign up there saying, no trespassing, stay out of my yard. Knock before you enter. We still have to do that. Even though there's going to be some that's not going to do it. Why? Because we're sinners. Born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But see, once a person comes to know Christ as Savior, the issue of abortion, homosexuality, and, and you keep on going on down the line, it will be resolved because a person will stop that. You cannot impose a rigorously law on on people who are not regenerated, but you as the church, see the government can do that. But see the problem is see the government can formulate laws and everything in a civil manner because they can, they don't give a hoot about what the church does. But as a, a citizen of your district, of your country, of your state, you must follow the rules and regulations. Whether you save or not. But you see, the point of the matter is the church. The church needs to start thinking different. The Christian needs to start thinking different. And say, look, you need to be born again. You need to be saved. I know you you does this, you fornicate, you adultery, you lie, you cheat, you steal, you murder, you kill, you commit crime, and I know this. Because we're, we're all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But that can be corrected through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And when that person does do that, the subject of murder, kill, steal, embezzlement, prejudice, bigotry, you keep on naming it, will be dissolved. It will be answered. Okay? We're going about it the wrong way. Instead of the church, see the government, okay, 
I'm not giving a license for the government to, to do that, but that's, that's part of their function. Because we have legislators, some are not saved, some are saved, and some are hypocrites, pretending that they are. But you see, the point of the matter is the church should not think on a legislation perspective, but in a biblical perspective. So when the scripture says, thou shall not, that's God's law, and it's a required duty. What is it that God requires of man? Obedience. Obedience to his will. What is his will? What is it that man is ought to obey by God? God's, here it is, commandment. I'm going to breathe you because I ain't got that much room. God's commandment. It's, that, that's what it is. The rule of obedience is revealed in his law. What is the law? The law is, that's where we at, the Ten Commandments. Okay? That's what the law is. We're not saying the law is sacrifice this and give up this and, you know, and observe the feast day and the holiday, the holy day, and, you know, and tithes and all that. And all, no, the, that, that's been taken away by the death of Jesus Christ. The ceremony, the the the, the, uh, the 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 ceremony law, the judicial law. What stands is the holy moral law of God. What is the law? So when the law is the Ten Commandments, when Moses came down, he came down with two tablets of written on it by the hand of God, the Ten Commandments. Correct? Okay. One tablet is our responsibility, God to man, man to God. Number one through four of the Ten Commandments. Right. The second part on the other tablet is man's relationship towards man, man to man. Number five, all the way down to number ten. So when Jesus came on the scene, when Jesus came on the scene, the question was asked, what is the greatest commandment? What is it? Yeah. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your might. And to love your neighbor as yourself. By this hangs all the laws and the commandments. He, he said that, see? What do you mean by that? That means that if you love God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, right, and you love your neighbor, okay, commandment number one to four, love your neighbor, commandment number what? Five to ten. All on these Jesus says, on these, these two, hangs all the laws and the prophets. It's amazing. So Jesus just couldn't key in that, well, the main, the greatest commandment is thou shalt not kill, or thou shalt not steal. Or the greatest commandment is thou shalt, no, what Jesus says, he didn't point to which one of the ten he just says the two categories within the Ten Commandments is one to four, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength. Commandment number five through eleven, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, that's where we are embarking on right now, commandment five to ten, which is number five, thou shalt not kill. Number six, I'm sorry, number six, Thou shalt not kill. If you don't kill, you love your neighbor. 
Now, the point of the matter is, what does it mean to, to kill? To kill means you're taking someone else's life from them, or you're taking your own life. You're robbing them of life. It's called murder. Whether you can call it premeditated, you can, it's still murder, it's kill. You don't really love your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Everybody. Everybody. It's not the person on your left and your right. It's not the person sitting in front of you or you know, behind you. Everyone. Because you got to love your neighbor, which is everyone. You got to what? Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not commit. Thou shall not. Thou shall not. That's your relationship towards man to man. That's what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. If you love yourself, you won't kill yourself. A person that commits suicide don't love themselves. And the Bible says that. You won't go across the aisle, go across the store. See, a per see all these shootings in different schools, it's murder. You're killing. That person has no love. You say all you want, oh, my, he, he, he loves me, but well, he don't love his neighbor. And that's what the scripture says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. The, the, the scriptures speak, see, some religions take it very, very far when it says, thou shalt not kill. That means... You shouldn't join the army. You shouldn't do this. See, even Moses stipulates the differ in his writing. I forgot the movie again. It was uh, Gary Cooper playing a, a guy who joined the army, but his religion, where he came from, saying that he, he, he didn't believe in killing someone, but he joined the army. Uh, you may know what movie that is, and, and this and that. And, and, and they had a code of ethics, I won't kill anyone, I won't shoot them. But you see, even the scriptures, both the, the, both the Old and New Testament, proves that to defend your, com uh, your, 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 your country, to defend your rights, and you got to make sure it's under legislation because you're obeying the law of the land. It is justified. That's why I say justifiable, you know, homicide or justifiable killing or whatever they want to call it, because we have confirmed that the reason why she killed this person or he did that is because he served in the army or this happened or something happened and was fearful of his life and such and such and the jury and the trial and such. But you see, God knows the truth and he sees. He knows within the intent of a person's heart how why they killed. But it's stipulated in this commandment, thou shalt not kill. The, the duties required in the sixth commandment are, are careful studies, lawful in, endeavors to preserve life of ourselves and others by resisting all thoughts and purposes. And, and it goes on and says, so you can't, no violence, no detrimental violence or anger towards someone that will cause them to lose their life. Even if you continue to send a letter to someone and antagonize fear in their lives, that's an act of killing. That's an act of homicide. Oh, yeah. So... That's what the scripture says. Thou shalt not kill. You cannot take the life of others or yourself, except in the case of public justice, lawful law, or necessary defense. And in each case, God sees it, and the government sees it, or the law sees it. And they say, you are, you are not convicted. You are not guilty of it. I shall not kill. Right. 
Let's look at the any questions before we move on to the seventh commandment. The seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery is the is the means whereby you have a sexual sin within the compound of being married. Fornication right, comes from the word, the Greek word pharmakia, which we get the word pharmaceutical or pharmacy, which is drugs, which is lines with, with illicit sex outside of marriage. So there's adultery, fornication. So it's in the same. So don't be that you say, well, I'm, 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 I'm not committing a, a adultery. I'm not married. And, and therefore, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not committing it. Well, you're committing a, 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 a lustful sin, which the scripture says you should not do. Because fornication is in the same grouping as adultery, sexual sin, sexual sin. The seventh commandment says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, when, in, see, in the scriptures, as we go back to Genesis, I want to look at that because that's so important. You see in Genesis chapter 2, when God made Eve, and brought Eve to Adam. Adam said this in Genesis 2.23, and Adam says, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called womb man, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. One flesh. Jesus rehearsed that in Matthew 19. Now what that means is all your love and allegiance and affection leaves from the dominated figure in your life, which is your mother and father, and is now being poured out towards your wife because you are one. A man is not one with his mother. A man is not one with his father. Now, many customs in different lands, sad to say, is that even though the man gets married, many feel as though that that man, that son, still needs to have his mother around, be dominated by his mother or his father. But the scripture says, no, no. You leave your mother and father. And you cleave to your wife because you are one. You're not one with your mother and father anymore. You are to love your wife above mom and dad. That, that's what the scripture teaches. In some cultures, they have it like that, but if it, and, and if you are a Christian, you can't respond in that manner. All right, turn to Matthew chapter 19. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, get that, then write also Romans chapter, um, Romans chapter uh, 7. Romans 7. Here's the scripture we're dealing with in the seventh commandment. I'm going to give them to you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and following. Matthew chapter 19, verse 1 and following. And Romans 7. Now we're going to get try and get to all of these in, in our lesson today. And you've got to be quick when you're, you've got to move now and either raise your hand or shout it out if you want to ask a question. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're dealing with the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Matthew 5, 27. You have heard 
This is tradition. Jesus, this is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So it's not the act, because the act starts within the heart. If you sit there and formulate it in your mind, you already committed adultery. What you're doing is you're simply taking an act out on that female, on that male, and, and that just, you're just adding seriousness to the compound. So Jesus said, see, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, and religious people, they tell you, oh no, oh no, as long as you don't touch them. No, it's not touch. It's not taste. It's commitment in the mind. If you look at a woman, a man, lustfully, you're already committed adultery in your heart. So God is both gonna is gonna charge, see this is how it is. See in society, you can't you can't force people how they're gonna dress and look, but they will be chargeable that if a woman shows her nakedness and a man shows his nakedness that prompts lustful desire, then they will that they will be chargeable as well as the person who looks at them and they begin to lust. We live in an evil society all around the globe. So here Jesus is saying you look at a woman lust and you commit it. But you look, see, you're looking with the intent of lustfulness. Your look is beyond beauty, of, that that person is attractive or handsome or beautiful or nice looking, wear good clothes. So you're looking beyond that and you're seeing you're lusting. That's when it becomes adultery in your heart. This is what Matthew 5, 27 is saying. Right, you look, but you don't look. Exactly. So that that re that reminds us in well, I don't mean to skip, but I have to because what I just said and what you commented on, and therefore I'm turning to First uh, Corinthians chapter seven. What had happened, there were certain things, Romans, 1 Corinthians 7, there were certain things going on in the Corinthian church that a certain individual or family, or individual really, uh, wrote to Paul and said, this was going on, this is going on, this is happening, they're suing each other, they're hating each other, but this is going on, immoral, sexual immorality is happening, and, that, and, it, and it just goes on. So Paul addresses the sexual immorality piece in chapter 6 and in chapter 7. Okay. So, Paul lets them know that if you are involved with sexual immorality and practicing it, you know, shacking up, having a girlfriend, going beyond the girlfriend-boyfriend relationship as far as sex, then Paul is saying, you, you, you know, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or, and, and men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor gr I'm reading a uh, verse. What was that? Verse uh, nine. Yeah, they, you will have. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. You're not. You're not going to heaven. But some. But but you used to do those things. See, the point of the matter is, we all at one point have broken. The, the law, law of God, law of man. We, that's why I said all his standing comes short of the glory of God. We have sinned. But what God is saying is, yes, we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. 
But to continue on in practicing and doing wicked and sinful things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But some of you were doing these things, as verse uh, 11 is said. But now you are washed. Now you are sanctified. Now you are justified. As a believer in Christ, you cannot use, oh, I, I just have a love for women and I want to have sex all the time. Or oh, I love getting drunk. Or oh, I love having babies and then getting abortion and abortion and abortion. I love killing. I love seeing. Then you say you're saved. The scripture says, no, you're not. You think you are, but you're not. This is what chapter 6, verses 9 through uh, 11 is talking about. Because there were some in the church thinking that they are saved, but they're still cheating on their wives, practicing this, practicing adultery, practicing fornication, practicing having sex with men, practicing thievery, practicing greedy, drunkenness, slandering, swindling, and all that. Paul says, no, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You haven't been transformed. You haven't been, you're not saved. Right, that's what he's saying. Yes, yeah, sexual sex with men. That's what the NIV is saying. No adulterers, no adulterers, no men who have sex with men. Homosexuals and also prostitution and selling your body. See, it's wrong to sell your body to get money to go to, go to college, to get that car. That's lust, that's adultery, that's fornication. You may pat hyping it up or anything. That's why he says in verse 18, Free from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whosoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you receive of God? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. How can a single person, a single woman, a single man glorify God in the area of sexuality. Here it is, chapter 7. Now, concerning the things that you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to have sexual relationships with a woman. But since sexual immortality, immortality is occurring, let each man have his sexual relationship with his own wife. Get married, for it's better to marry than to burn. Now that doesn't mean to fulfill your lust of sexual appetite. Just marry the girl so you can have sex. That ain't what Paul is saying. Now in the King James, in the King James, it says this. Now concerning the thing where you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. That has nothing to do with touching the woman. Again, remember what Jesus says, whosoever looks upon a woman, feels, fungal her, touch her with a lustful desire, you have committed adultery, you have committed fornication. It is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. See, these are single people here in verse 1. And Paul lets them know, as a single person, if you want to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now, in counseling, it's more to that than what you read. Right? There's love, there's commitment, there's willing to stay with that person till death do you part. It's a willingness to share, to be humble, to respect it. All of that is right in there when you about to get married. It's called premarital counseling. <laughs> okay. Let the husband render unto the wife her due benevolence and what likewise. See, once you become one, you're not one with your mother no more. So stop telling your mother or your mother-in-law dominate your home. And stop allowing your father, your father-in-law, dominate your home. 
wives, mothers, you are under submissive to your husband. The husband, you are to love and treat your wife above your own mother and father. You're one with your wife. Each person, husband and wife, has a control over their bodies towards each other in the realm of sexuality. When the wife has her sexual urge and desires, only her husband can conquer it. Vice versa, the wife to the husband. When you go outside of that, that's adultery, as Paul is going to stipulate later on. And that's why in verse 5 it says, Defraud not one another except it be consent. For a time that you give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and then come together again, lest you be tempted, because the husband can be tempted when the wife doesn't fulfill her obligation and vice versa. Because remember, you're one. You're one. Okay. Then he goes on. I, I don't. I'm, I wasn't planning to go through First Corinthians seven, but since we're here, Paul says now to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Paul says I'm. I'm. A, I'm. I'm not married. In my present state, I'm not married. I wish everybody could remain that, but everyone just does not have the gift. Just like everyone does not have the gift of being a mechanic or this and that or a talent to do this or to teach or be a doctor, to be a nurse, to be a lawyer, each one has its own calling and a vocation. Some can leave high school and go straight to work. Some leave high school and go to college. Some go from high school and go to the armed services. Wherein your calling you do. But in the realm of marriage, everyone is not called to marry. But you, as a Christian, you marry only in the Lord, those who are saved. Because you cannot be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. There's many occasions in which a Christian woman will marry an unsaved person and thinking they will convert them. That you can't do that. They do it. That doesn't make them unsaved. But Paul says, I spare you, you're going to have difficulties. So you got widows, you got unmarried people, and you got married people. Then within that realm, you got divorced people, you got uh, remarried people. And those subjects we will talk about later on. Marriage, divorce, remarriage. Widows. A widow is one who lost their mate by means of uh, death, and they're not married. They are widows now. Okay? Then there's unmarried uh, people in the church, in the home, who are single, who are not married. When you're unmarried and you have sexual, committed sexual sins, that's called fornication. When you're married and you commit sexual sins, it's called adultery. The seventh commandment is what? Thou shall not, thou shall not commit adultery. So that means all unclean thoughts, imaginations, purposes, and affections, corrupt or filthy communication, wantonness, immodest apparel. All that is part of luring and lusting, which you are going to give accountable for before God when you stand before Him at the judgment seat of Christ. Unbelievers. Oh, yeah. So, what the Romans did in the early centuries is that they said, what? Well, remember the old Roman law of marriage? You live. After seven years, and you, you proclaim yourself husband and wife, God says no. <laughs> I didn't say that. That's why Jesus repeats it himself in in the Beatitudes when he says, "It has been said by men of old." Because you can't go along with traditions. 
you got to go with the scripture says. The will of God is for a man to be married to avoid fornication. But that might not be your giftedness in that area. The eighth commandment, thou shall not steal. The duty requires in the eighth commandment is to be true and faithfulness and just and contracts and commerce between man and man, rendering to everyone his due. Modest judgments and wills and judgments, worldly goods, I should not fail. I think in this culture that we're in the 21st century, we don't need a whole lot of understanding of what it means to steal. Okay? <laughs> taking that which is not yours, taking someone else's wife, taking someone else's money, home, furniture, whatever, taking that which is not yours. Okay? Embezzlement. <laughs> the ninth commandment is what? Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. You're truly lying and, 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 and covering up for, the, for whatever reason. Bearing false witness against your neighbor is lying. And that is an injustice. You're not giving a, a, a good report. You're giving an evil report. That's for anybody. That's the duty of man, save or unsaved. Thou shalt not steal. Save or unsaved. That's why the commandments abide. A Christian, according to Paul's writing here, is saying that we are perfect law keepers in Christ Jesus. But then there's a warring member in us that wars against the spirit. Because the flesh do not want to do what the Spirit demands. The Spirit said, live holy, live righteous, serve God, be obedient, walk upright, serve the Lord, do good to your neighbor, love your neighbor, be honest, be true. But the flesh says, no, retaliate, seek revenge, do evil, mess them up, mess around, uh, fornicate, lie, cheat, steal. See, that's what the flesh, and that's why Paul says, uh, 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 oh, who will deliver me from this body of sin? Romans chapter 7. So the Christian is still struggling. But within the Christian, there is the Holy Spirit of God that compels us, that gives us strength to resist that. The unbeliever cannot resist. They have no power from God to resist. To maintain themselves from practicing sin. The believer has the Holy Spirit that keeps them from practicing sin. The unsaved, being born of the Spirit of God, cannot help themselves in practicing and, 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 and doing what the flesh says. The flesh says, get drunk, get drunk, they get drunk. The flesh says, commit sexual immorality, the flesh the, the person does it, idolatry, uh, men with men, thieves, drunkenness, greediness, slandering, swindlers, whatever. But such people that practice this shows that they are not true or believers. Because true believers, he that is born of God does not commit sin, does not practice sin because the seed is in him. That seed is the Holy Spirit and he cannot sin. He cannot practice sin. The child of God is righteous. They are capable of living out the holy law of God. The unsaved cannot. They cannot, but it's still your duty required of God to obey. This is his earth. You are his creation. I want you to do this and do this and do this. Well, Lord, why, God, why must I do this? Because I created you. 
I am the creator, and this is what I require of you. Now, what purpose then serves the law? If we're not able to keep it, that's not the point. God didn't give the law for us to keep. See, that's that's the whole that's the whole holdback. What we gotta come to understand that the law was given to show us our sinfulness, to bring us to Christ, to convict us of our wrong. And that's so stipulated in the book of Galatians. And I'm turning there. Galatians chapter 3, let's turn there, verse 19. See, that's the point. The expectation of God, you say, well, God, why did you give the law? Why the Ten Commandments? Why law anyway? When you know we're going to break it, you know, well, that's not the point. The point is, I'm giving you this to show you your duty and your responsibility and to show you that you are sinful and you need me. Galatians 3.19 Wherefore then serves the law? What's the purpose of the law? It was added because of sin. Transgression. <laughs> right. Had man had went on, Adam and Eve had went on ignoring the devil and not falling into sin, there was no need for, for a law. But like Paul says in Romans 7, when, when the law came, I revived. I pushed back at it. So I'm interested. That's why we need to study the scriptures. We need the law to show us that we are sinners. That's why the gospel is not completely preached or told to an unsaved person unless you tell them that they are a sinner, they have broken God's law, they need to repent and believe on Jesus Christ that he came and died for sinners, he was buried and he rose again. When you repent of your sins and trust Jesus, you will be saved. We have, we have divided and taken away the law. And all we tell people is the gospel is the good news. Jesus died on the cross for everyone. God loves you. That is not right. That is not right. There are millions of people who have died on their deathbed, being shot, crushed in a car, overnight, quit, whatever it may be, and died with the thought on their mind, God loves me, God loves me, God loves me, and they died. Now, when that person is resurrected at the judgment, they're going to have confidence that God is going to take them to heaven. But they're going to hear the solemn word after he judged them, depart from me, you're sentenced to death. And they're going to rebel and say, oh God, no, I worked, I did this, I did this in your name, I cast out demons, I, I, Lord, I did wonderful work, I, 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 I was an outstanding citizen. Depart from me, I never knew you. I didn't say you didn't do those things, but I never knew you. To know Jesus is to have been repentant of your sins and trust Him as your Savior. See, that's the fault of the local church now, is that we're putting the cart before the horse. We're, we're telling people, get your house in order, set yourself right, get baptized, join the church, stop smoking, stop drinking, stop fornicating, stop being a homosexual, stop aborting babies, stop killing, stop, no, you, you can't stop, no, no, repent. Repent and tell them what repent means. Tell them that they've broken God's law. 
You can't get out there in the streets and tell people you're you a fornicator and you're you're messing with women and you're homosexual and, and God is going to judge you for your sin. And they know that. Give them the gospel. The gospel does not nitpick at what a person is. It tells them, the gospel tells them, you need to repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. That's what I mean at the outskirts at the beginning when I was saying the church is telling people to do things which they cannot do. Even though God requires of them as creation, as creator, he requires all men to obey his will, and his will is his law. But I can't do it, I can't do it. That's the point. You need me. You re repent, you're a sinner, you're lost. That's the whole point. What then serves the law? It was added because of transgression till the seed could come. Who's the seed? Christ. Verse 14, wherefore, well, I shouldn't skip. I, I'm not going to skip because I'm going to go to verse 20. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one. That's, that's Galatians 3.20. Now, a mediator is not the mediator of one, but God is one. Verse 21. Is the law then against the promise of God? Now remember, the law is holy, the law is just, the law is good. So, thou shalt not have any other gods, thou shalt not bow, thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Well, why, why, why do the holy law of God condemns me because you have sinned. That's why and that's what he means. Is the law against the promises of God? No. It's against you because we have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God forbid. Notice, for if there had been, I'm reading Romans, I'm in Galatians 3.21, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. See, the point of the matter, the Ten Commandments, the moral law cannot save you. It never will. It never could. It points you to your sinfulness. It points to your transgression. It tells you you are a sinner. It shows you your affliction that you are lost without Christ. That's the whole matter of the law. Because the scripture says, verse 22, Galatians 3, 22, but the scriptures have concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto thy faith, which should afterwards be revealed. See, our sinfulness kept us from faith. What the law did, and see, that's why the preachers got to preach the law. The law and the gospel. By preaching the law, it tells, well, I can't do that. You say, thou shalt not, I can't do it. Well, that's the point, to show you your sinfulness, your weakness. You are without God in your life because you're practicing being disobedient to God. There it is, verse 24. Wherefore the law, law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. that we might be justified. I, 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 see, I, I, it's so plain there. 
The law shows us. It brings through the power of, see, when the preacher preach the gospel, he includes the message of the law. <clears throat> He don't random say, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. He doesn't say, stop sinning, stop sinning, stop drinking, stop drinking, stop fornicating. He doesn't do that. That's not what preaching is about. Preaching is saying this by the law. God gave the law to man. It is required. We are not fulfilling it because we're sinners. But the good news is this. Jesus Christ, Son of God, came into the world to die for sinners. That if you will repent of your sin and admit to God that you have broken his law and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will be converted. You will be saved. You will be transformed. You will receive eternal life. That's, that's the message. But our church has gotten away from it. The church has gotten away from it. They don't see the need. They say, well, we're not under law. We're, not, we're under grace. It, it, it's clear that a person do not have a clear understanding of the word of God from Romans chapter 2 to Romans 8. It, it's very clear. Even Galatians 3, they have no idea. We're following a a school of thought, which is dispensationalism, which majority of us were brought under, and we don't want to lose grip with that. And we're defended. We're, and you may be a Christian, and you're defended till you die. And that's okay. That's okay. But when Christ comes back, your rewards will be diminished or deducted for whatever way God Christ is going to do. All right. All right. We didn't finish. We, we, we needed the ninth. We said, Thou shalt not steal. We said, Steal, right? Yeah. And the last, yeah, we know we was at the ninth. Yeah, right. Well, let's finish the tenth so we can stop it and we can call it quick, okay? We're going over our time, but that's okay. The tenth commandment is this. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Why? If you love your neighbor, if you love yourself, you won't do that. See what Jesus was saying? If you love your neighbor, as you love yourself, you will not kill, you will not steal, you will not lie, you will not prejudice yourself, you will not come here. Wow! Because you what? Loving your neighbor as you love yourself. All right. That's the Ten Commandments there. And it's all read out in Exodus chapter 20 and other passages of Scripture. And um, I want to thank the Lord for this outstanding lesson. Now next week in our discipleship class at 10, at 10 o'clock, we're going to continue discipling uh, people, both saved and unsaved, by dealing with the commission in Matthew 28, uh, 19, go into all the world and make disciples of people. And once we make disciples of people, getting them to learn about Christ, repenting of their sins, and trust Jesus Christ as Savior, we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all in Jesus' name. They, we line them up with a church, a gathering, in the home, in the building, in a structure, in a cathedral, in a second floor, wherever they meet it, so they can grow under the elders and the word of God and be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you for the blessed word of God and the truth of your word. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your law. We thank you that it does govern our lives. And we pray, Father, that we will continue as saints of God to grow in your word, grow in grace, grow in knowledge, and understanding of the word of God. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All right, now our, our morning worship is going to start at uh, 11.30, so it's about 25 more minutes. So we're going to come back to everybody at 11.30. We're in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Thank you. 